Good evening, everybody. Tuesday night. This is Gideon from Mana Entertainment, and we're here with the fourth installment of our series, How to Make a Game Studio, Part 4. For this one, we're going to be focusing on game production and planning. Game production and planning. So what does that have to do with making a game studio? Um, actually, it has everything to do with it. It's the reason why every single studio that has crashed and burned in the last few years, um, since probably 2013, and I think even be before that, a lot of studios have been crashing and burning lately, and, and it sucks for us. It doesn't just suck for us as fans of these studios. It sucks for us as people who work in the game industry, because then you have these experienced people who are awesome at what they do, and you know, and then you have newbies that don't know what they're doing, but they're trying to get into the game industry, and they want to get entry-level positions, but now these entry-level positions are being taken by these pros because they need to eat and feed their families, and they have more experience than the newbies. So it's very bad for the game industry. Before we get into it, I just want to let you know that what we're going to be talking about, game production and planning, has to do with what the professional world knows as project management. And we're going to delve a little bit into Agile and Scrum, which I believe is the best way to run a game studio, especially if you're working with teams remotely. And if you're, and if you're, even if you're working on site, on location, it's even better on site because it's a little informal, but it's also meant to get things done in small releases. So we'll get into it. Um, here's the opening. After that, we'll, we'll get started. Alright, so do you want to know why most game studios fail and why they, they crash and burn and why all of a sudden you just hear about studios that you were looking forward to their games just ending? It's 90% of the time it has to do with bad planning and bad management. Now, when it comes to management, we're talking about the hours that they're making people work and when we talk about planning, we're talking about how they could have avoided those hours, specifically crunch, you know, working 20 hour days, working 100 hour weeks. These are things that the game industry is notorious for. And it's, it's actually not that difficult to believe when you consider that most game studios or most successful game studios were made by people who just wanted to make a game, wanted to have fun, started making a ton of money. They didn't really know what to do with that. So they just ran it to the best of their ability and they didn't focus on the business aspect of the game industry, which is immensely important, all right? So when it comes to studios like this, you're gonna see here that we have pictures. We have a picture that we're gonna show you of, um, we got some articles here of studios that crashed and burned. And most recently, the one that everybody's talking about is Telltale. Telltale, it, it sucks that that studio went under because I have friends that work in Telltale. Um, I have a friend who she used to be one of the main recruiters at, at Telltale. Her name is Megan. And, um, you know, man, like, she, I, I wanted to work there. I was close to working there, but I'm glad I didn't at this point because I would have been out of a job just like most of those other guys. And, you know, unfortunately, back in November 2017, as you can see here in this picture here, the company announced that it was laying off 90 developers. I'm not going to read every single part, but the parts that I, that I highlighted, it was due to constant overwork toxic management and creative stagnation, right? But if you look a little bit further down, you'll see that it says overwork, job insecurity, and profound burnout are omnipresent concerns, they mean in the game industry. More than three quarters of developers report working under crunch conditions, which means working up to 20 hours a day and more than 100 hours a week. These practices have a significant and debilitating cost to employees, one that often feels baked into video game development culture. This article was written in 2018 by Megan, and I apologize if I'm butchering your name, but it's Megan Farah Manesh. I think I got that right. Maybe the, the Hebrew training is paying off there. Farah Manesh. <laughs> Farah Manesh. Okay. Yeah, so it was written by Megan Farah Manesh in two, March 2018 in The Verge. Another piece that I want to share with you was this one done by Brendan Sinclair at GameIndustry.biz back in September 2018, which was last month. Right? Now, if you look here, we're discussing why Riot died, right? Or not necessarily why they died, but why they lost such a huge amount of their of their best workers and basically why they were in the news for being like, you know, in a horrible situation. So um, if, you, if you look at this 
excerpt here. In August, Kotaku published a report based on conversations with 28 then current and former Riot employees, painting a damning picture of a truly toxic work culture, beginning with the higher, highest executives in the company and permeating through the ranks. It was a fall from grace from the studio that was winning the best places to work. So it used to be that Riot was, you know, like considered one of the best places to work. And then all of a sudden they had to let a bunch of people go. And again, this had to do with work conditions becoming very horrible, meaning that the planning wasn't there to back up the, the actual management. So when things started going, you know, when things started hitting the fans, so to speak, and you got all these people that are basically needing to get paid, but your project is not bringing in the money that it needs to bring, obviously you're gonna have an issue, right? So I'm not gonna get extremely detailed into it, um, but I will give you the resources if you need to go and train yourself and better yourself on these things. The first thing that I wanna really recommend is learn project management skills. In fact, I highly recommend that you use the website that I'm gonna show you here. It's, um, it's perfect for Scrum Agile and Game Dev. Uh, it's called freescrumtraining.org slash training. That website, you can actually get a Scrum Master certification, the lowest possible level of it, but it's it's so immensely valuable in the game industry. When you're running a game, when you're running a studio, multiple projects, even for one project. So if you take your time to go through the course, it's about four or five sections, and it's really, um, it's not the most advanced form of Agile and Scrum, but it's really cool because to break down what Agile and Scrum is for managing a game project, a company, or you know several projects like I said before, Agile takes um, all the processes of project management, which is planning. The planning phase is where you come up with the ideas, the blueprints, in our case, the game design document, all that kind of stuff. Um, initiation is when you actually start you know, getting the, the resources, the people that you need to, to make it happen. Then comes the work, you know, the working phase, and after that, after the, you know, the execution, I'm sorry, that's called the execution phase. After the execution comes the, the testing phase, which is basically like QA. And then from testing, you have release, right? So it's, it's usually six steps in traditional project management in the style waterfall. Waterfall, you do those processes in that order. You do, you know, the planning, you get all the resources you need, you do the work, then you test the work. And when it's good to go, when you green light it, you, you, you know, you basically release the product, right? And then you have the postmortem, which is basically like deciding like, okay, what went right? What went wrong? You know, these kind of things. And um, so when you do that in traditional project management, this is why a lot of companies that are successful, like huge multi-million dollar, multi-billion dollar companies, they invest in project managers, right? It's not just something that you can easily do because you you heard about it and you you know the concepts like project managers are important and the reason they make a lot of money typically in the industries in any industries is because they are the the line of defense between your studio making bad decisions that are going to cost it money and cause it to go down and burn and basically making good decisions that are going to cost that's going to cause the teams to work on time finish a project on time hopefully under budget and actually you know succeed and um, one of the tools that Scrum masters use and Agile, you know, project managers, well, in the game world, we're called game producers, right? But one of the tools that we use is something called a burnout chart. So I'm gonna show you guys a picture of a burnout chart here. And uh, I'll, I'll link to, I'll put the links in the description about where it is. And I actually got it from a website from Luis Con, um, Goncalves, I'm sorry, .com. And he, he does a really good job. I'll put the link there too. He does a really good job of explaining um, simple, simplified versions of comp complicated things. Like the burnout, the burndown chart is one of those things that people typically either get it or they don't when it comes to project management. But I love this picture and I love this style because he, he makes it simple. So if you see on the left side, your, your scale is basically total effort. And on the bottom, you see the iterations. That means that's the sprint that you're on. So in traditional Scrum and Agile, a sprint is two weeks, right? But it can be two to four weeks. And what that means is, remember how I talked about the phases, the, the planning, intro, all that kind of stuff, the, the six steps? Well, in a Scrum project, what you do is you do all of those six steps within a sprint. So every sprint, you'll start with the, have the main design that was done originally, but it'll evolve. So the next sprint, you'll start with designing again, things that didn't work after testing it in the first sprint. You're gonna execute and fix the things that didn't work. You're going to test those things and make sure that they work. And then you're gonna release another playable build. When I was working at EA Tiburon, that was 
they did use Agile for the most part. And the reason I know that is because I was only working in QA. I was not a producer at EA. And uh, I was working on PGA Tour, the you know the Tiger Woods game. And um, <laughs> I had a blast working on that game. It was so much fun because there was some bugs and some glitches. I, I What can I say? I love comedy, right? I appreciate comedy. So while I'm not a, the hugest fan of sports games in general, um, I did like golf because I was playing a lot of Wii Golf at the time. But uh, <laughs> that's the reason I like golf, right? Like, yeah, go figure. But anyway... I love that game because there was hilarious things that were happening, things that I got in trouble for because, you know, I was young and naive, I didn't know, and like, for example, I would put things in the comments of the of the bug report, like, oh, um, the, the <laughs> what was it, the, the golfer was doing a dalsim spin, right, and he was basically like wrapping around himself like this and doing something like when he was trying to hit the, he was trying to hit the ball. So things like that, you know, I made a lot of silly mistakes. That's going to be for another video, though. I'm going to do um, a series on how to get into the game industries, what uh, what mistakes to avoid when you're trying to get in, when you get in, all that kind of stuff. I'll do a, another little series for you guys. And uh, I don't know who's going to watch it, but hopefully whoever does, I hope it really benefits you because, you know, um, my thing is all about I want to succeed, but I, I prefer being the type of person who succeeds with others succeeding with me. That's my that's my plan. That's my goal. So anyway, going back to the burn down chart, you know, here on the t on the top, you can see the team velocity. Velocity is determined in project management, which you'll learn if you take that that free course. Velocity is determined by how much the team can get done in a sprint, right? So let's say on the first sprint, you have no idea what the velocity is. You have a certain team, you have certain team members, and you ask them, "What can you do? Estimate what you could do, like like in in two weeks." And they'll tell you, I think I could do this, this, and that, right? So what you do is you'll test it, and then in the next sprint, you'll see the results. And you'll see, oh, look, 10 points here, right? Um, work done that iteration and work remaining. So what you're seeing is literally the chart is burning down. It's going down because you're getting more and more tasks done. And the reason that this is awesome for game design, for game development, is because usually everything in game development is done on dependencies right so and dependencies can change and that's what's the beauty of agile if you do things in the traditional way and waterfall um you know or like kanban or like original pmp style project management the problems you're going to run into is that you might do everything fantastic get to the last phase where you're testing and right before you release the product you're dealing with investors you're dealing with stakeholders you're dealing with people that have the money that are putting into your project and when they do that, they might not like it. And imagine if you took six months to, let's say, two to three years to do that. And then all of a sudden they're like, we hate this. This is not what we wanted at all. We're going to pull the plug. We're going to pull the money. You can see how that can cause some studios to shut down, right? This is not exactly what we wanted. So this is one of the reasons why it's so recommended in software development and in game development to use Agile. Agile and Scrum is so, so important, guys. All right, so... We're going to go on to the next topic now, which is I'm actually going to show you guys the hypothetical budget that I would have used for Mana Entertainment if we had this amount of money. And the reason I'm going to do that is to show you guys how expensive game development can be. And my projections, well, you'll see. Let me get into it. Let me pull it up. Give me a second. So what you guys are seeing here is the Space Exodus initial budget estimate. OK, this is very realistic. OK, this is with no budget constraints. This is assuming that we found investors that were like, man, we love what you guys are doing. We believe in your project. We want to fully fund it, which um, sad to say, I, I would have had an investor that could have gotten us maybe one seventh of the way there. And that would have been good enough to like raise more money. But to tell you the truth, even though the investor was a friend and um, I, I do appreciate him making that offer, I don't deny that it would have been a great help. But my thing was when I made Mana Entertainment, I always wanted to have creative freedom and I didn't want that creative freedom to be stifled or held back by investors telling us what they think is a good idea of a game. Now, don't get me wrong. There is such a thing as um, as people, you know, like as crowdfunding and stuff like that. But there's, uh, I forgot what the term is. I want to say it's angel investors. I may be wrong. But um, those are the, 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 the investors that I'm talking about are the type that they just want to see something succeed. So they'll give the money without expecting anything in return. Now, typically, you won't find something like this unless you've already had a great measure of success, which unfortunately I did not have. But that being said, I want to show you guys the, the initial budget estimate for Space Exodus, right? So check it out here, guys. 
right here, as you can see, the resources are on, on this row right here. Quantity, individual item cost, cost per month, total cost, right? So this is the initial budget. So I was originally, my, my original team consists of me, Christopher Rosario, and let me rephrase that, not my original team, my team that actually worked, that was loyal, that was that stuck through and that did what they said they were gonna do, was myself, Christopher Rosario, AKA Gideon, Carlos Franco, Mike Bacon Jr., you know, Carlos is our artist, Mike is our music guy. And then if we wanted to find a lead programmer and a programmer, because we had a lot of issues with programmers, we had to get rid of five or six programmers, like before we even got to the point where we had my friend, DJ, Adedeji, that I mentioned before, actually build a prototype of the game because none of the guys that I had were actually doing what they said they were gonna do. That, I want you guys to just get it out of your head right now. If you can't program yourself, if you can't make games on your own, don't expect programmers to just jump on your game unless they absolutely love you or your idea so much that they don't wanna do anything else, which I'm gonna tell you is not very often. But anyway, so my idea was hire a lead programmer who can do um, you know, the majority of the work and, and basically instruct another programmer, as you can see here, the lead and the, and the regular programmer. And uh, the ship artists, we actually had somebody do this for us um, on a smaller budget. We basically paid them much less than what you see here. But anyway, if you look at what we got, so we have one, two, one, two, three, four, sorry, five, six people, right? These are the human resources. Um, for these six people, we basically would have spent, what was it, 55000 times three for myself, Mike, and Carlos. And then we wanted to pay the lead programmer 62000 and uh, basically, you know, um, the programmer 57000 Now, if you look at the rate of what that is, $62,000 divided by, not 52, because if you look at the duration, the duration of the project was supposed to be... Um, let me see, what was it here? Yeah, the duration of the project was supposed to be eight months, right? So eight months was the duration of the project. So if we divide that by eight and divide that by four weeks in a month and divide that by 40, that's $48 an hour, right? So that's, that's for eight, basically for eight months of work. And what we wanted to do was have that so that we can get everything done quickly, not have to mess around too much. But these these people were going to need somewhere to work, right? So we found I found a place where the rent was uh, for the office space basically going to be see cost per month here total cost uh, was going to be four hundred and fifty dollars. So it would have been thirty six hundred for the whole um, duration of the of the of the rent. Average electricity being at two fifty two thousand. Average water being at 65 and average internet being at 70, uh, basically, you know, that would have been 520, 560, and then this is the furniture and the office supplies, which if you see here, this is actually real items with links that actually, let, let's see if these links still work. Yeah, so see, this is actually the place that I was looking at. I don't even know if it's still available, but from 595 a month, it's a nice place in downtown Orlando which um going back to here these are all actual items and this is all the actual cost so it came out to around five thousand seven hundred sixty nine dollars and this would have been for the eight months um basically to have all the equipment that we needed for eight months and oh also software costs right because you don't need just human resources you also need your software so microsoft 10 keys were about a hundred dollars uh we only needed two of those keys Unity 5 um, Pro, which uh, two keys, was about $3,000. Um, Google Docs, free. Paint.net was free. Miscellaneous software, uh, 5000 We just have, you know, rainy day just in case money, in case something goes wrong. Uh, we needed to have five workstations, and I picked really good top-of-the-line stuff. Uh, you know, some workstations, some, I, some iMac desktops, because I've been told, I'm not 100% sure if this is true, that you can't publish to iOS without a Mac desktop. So basically two computers per per person, which is really, you don't need that. And then an NVIDIA GeForce GTX 1080, right? So that's the, that was at the time, this was the price. And basically, what are you looking at? You're looking at a grand total of $746,640.12. Now, this is also including 
$250,000 of marketing, right? Which this would have been who we were going with, Spark Rocket Marketing Campaign. And grassroot marketing would have been like, you know, just general like social media, how much money we would spend on ads and stuff like that. 50,000, right? This is with no budget constraints at all. Now, I did one with everything being 25 to 49% reduced. That would have been $580,160.36. I did one that was a severe price drop, which is the lowest that anybody would probably do. Now, this was working remotely, but still paying people to get things done would have been $434,310. Now, like I told you, that investor that I knew was originally going to give us $100,000, $150,000, I think it was, to invest in our company, but that would have put us at a tight schedule, which honestly, we couldn't have afforded. If we were to do all of this right here, we wouldn't have been able to afford it. So switching gears real quick. So this video is a little bit longer than the other ones. If you didn't watch it, that's okay. Um, it's not meant for everybody. It's meant for people that are actually taking, you know, making a game and a game studio seriously. I'm taking it seriously. You know, that's that's what I'm doing. I'm in the process of this right now. I mean, I've already done most of the work, but uh, we're still not done. We're only in a beta phase of the game. We need to, I need to find a programmer to basically, I have a good programmer who's probably gonna get it to the stage where at least we could start marketing a little bit, you know, spend some money there. Um, cause obviously I wanna pay my guys. Cause in reality, we didn't do uh, rather, I didn't do a, I didn't do it with money, right? I didn't do a budget. I did a profit share. I mentioned this in one of our, our previous videos where I actually am sharing 60% of whatever the game makes with the whole development team. That means the artists, the designers, uh, you know, people working on the website, people uh, like Laura, you know, that, that means um, the music team. That means uh, anybody who basically puts their hand into the game, into the pot, they're sharing 60% of whatever the profit makes. Ideally, I want that profit to be high enough that they don't need to look for work and they can keep working with us in the future and we can hire some more people to help them so we have a smoother process for the next game. So a profit share is, in my, in my opinion, it's the safest method to start a game company, but it is also going to be by far the slowest and most frustrating method. The reason for that is because most people, the majority of people have the mentality, I'd rather have five bucks now than 50 bucks later. And what that means is those those budgets that you see, the money that we came up with, the hypothetical, they'd rather be paid that this year than be paid hundreds of millions of dollars or just say millions of dollars in the future. And there's no guarantee for that. So I can understand where they're coming from too, because you know, we gotta eat, we gotta pay bills, people need to live. So I'm not mad at people for, for not getting things done, which brings me to the, my final point for this video, which is the most important thing when it comes to project management when it comes to production and planning right those three things the most important thing is whether you are working with a budget or whether you are working with absolutely no money and you're going in free and doing as much work as you can for free and you will have to pay things that don't get me wrong I, it wasn't completely free for us we've been doing this for three years we haven't spent a ton of money but we have spent all the extra money we have into this project and when you're working with people, the most important thing to remember, especially when it comes to management is, is that everybody has their own project management style, but respect and, and dignity, treating people with dignity is the most paramount thing that you can do, especially, especially if you're not paying them upfront. You know, you can't demand or expect people to do things that even, even if you can do it, you can't demand somebody else to do it because they're helping you. And they're, if they're helping you, if they sign a contract with you, if they, if they sign an agreement with you, which you're going to want to look into making a contract, um, I'm not going to share the contract that I have because, uh, you know, for legal purposes, and it was made expressly for me with a, you know, without intent for distributing it online. But you can talk to a lawyer, talk to any IP lawyer, look for an intellectual property lawyer in your state or wherever you are. Because uh, intellectual property laws vary in the United States, they all vary, but um, for the most part, you know, business is the same no matter where you go. But um, ideally, you want to treat people like human beings, right? You don't want to ask them to do things that are going to break them, that are going to burn them out, and that are going to stress them to the point where they don't want to work with you anymore. So um, if you ask any of the guys that I've worked with, my management style is. I have a sense of urgency, but I also try to remember that because I'm not paying people, I can't make demands. And even if I was paying people, right, I want them to work with that same sense of urgency, but not with this crippling, like, oh my God, if I don't get it done by this exact day on the sprint, we're, you know, that's it, I'm done, I'm going to be pieced out, like, I, I, I can't work with this person anymore. 
So that's very important, right? You gotta treat people like human beings and you gotta remember, part of the reason why the game industry sucks right now, because I'm gonna tell you, it sucks. It really freaking sucks. Is because they don't treat people like humans in most places. They treat you like another, you know, asset. They treat you like something that they can just get and throw away at their convenience and they can hire you back if they like you enough. But truth be told, who wants that, right? I mean, yeah, maybe you want that. Maybe you're gonna wanna be like, yeah, hire me. Oh my God, I wanna work for, XYZ huge company and that would be great. That's fun. Don't get me wrong There's still companies that I would work for there are some companies that I would not even knock on their door I wouldn't even say hello, right? But um My point is you're gonna want to be careful with how you treat people because it's a small world uh, People will remember things. I myself made the mistake of um, I'm the kind of person who I'm very honest and I don't bite my tongue when it comes to certain things and not only am I very honest, but I'm also uh, you know I, I was under the impression for a while that I, I knew more than I did, which was a big mistake of mine. I regret doing that, but um, that's one of the reasons that I uh, shut some doors where they could have been open, but I've learned from those mistakes, and that's probably the thing that you gotta take home. If you need to take home from this video is learn from your mistakes, treat people with dignity, plan, and don't let your lack of planning or lack of good management cause the destruction of your company, especially if you're being invested in whether it's crowdfunding or whether it's investors. If you're not being invested in and you're doing it just on your own you know, free will, remember, if you give up, that's it. Nobody cares, nobody's gonna hear about your game, nobody's gonna know about it. You can still push it. This, this is a market where people can throw out a game now and it can get popular five years from now. You just never know. So, you know, I hope that helps you. Thank you so much. This has been Gideon from Mad Entertainment. I hope you guys have an awesome day. Video's long, but I'm pretty sure you can agree that it, it was necessary. So thank you so much. Have an awesome day, awesome night, whenever you're watching this. And um, yeah, look forward to more content. We should have the next video the following Thursday at around 9 a.m., if I'm not mistaken. Thank you so much. Please like and subscribe if you haven't. And uh, if you did, we appreciate it. And if you're watching the videos, if you actually watched it to the completion, we really appreciate it because it's not easy for us to do it, especially for me, because uh, I have four babies and they're asleep right now. So see you later. Gideon from Man Entertainment. Have a great day.